What's going on, fellas? How you doing? I'm grateful, and you? Yeah, you know, uh, taking it one day at a time. Some days easier than others. I think the last time I saw you, saw you in person, was probably at the United Nations. Was that the last time we saw each other? It's very possible. I've I've lost. Yeah. Um, I've lost. I think we've done something since then, memory. but I think that's the last time I saw you, like in yeah. person. You know, yeah, we are that's the very UN. possible. But man, you are um, super special guy, and your your journey, you know, all the way from South Africa to. Um, the states, and that's not to say that one place is above other. Like you know, saying you went from South Africa to America, and that's a step up. No, it's like I think what I'm trying to say is that you know your global travels, like just continues, and and what you're able to do every time you make your mark. It's like you know people understand more and more. Like your perspective is is necessary. It's a, it's one of those things where it's like people need that, to hear. I appreciate you that. Know, for people real. need to hear that that balance and you know, and again, coming from where you come from, um you know more than anybody like balance is necessary, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And um and freedom is not and democracy, like democracy is one of those words that I feel like is abused. That's like being in LA and somebody telling you, oh my God, I'm, obs <laughs> I'm obsessed. Oh yeah. yeah. Or amazing. Or like you're in a marketing meeting and someone says, youth culture is so important. <laughs> or the culture, <laughs> you know. And you know, um, democracy is one of those like really badly abused words. Yeah. Um, but you, of all people, you know, coming from your country, like you know what democracy wasn't and you know what it is and you know what it it could actually even be it could be even more so and yeah, so it's, to it's have pretty you it's pretty wild man it's pretty wild do what you yeah. do is amazing so i'm shutting up nah man thank <laughs> you p i appreciate that um you know it's funny you say that because like it is it is something that i appreciate as a journey you know um coming from south africa to the u.s going from south africa to anywhere really you know because I always say with my friends and family, many of us are the first generation of, you know, first generation to go to a school, first generation to go to a school with other white kids, first generation to, to um, board a plane, for first generation to go to another country, first generation to have a passport, first generation to do so many things. And I, I think that's something I don't take for granted is because, you know, South Africa is one of the youngest democracies in the world. And so inevitably that means you will have so many firsts in families, so many firsts in, in, in communities. So, um, so it really has been something that I've, 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 I've tried to never take for granted because I can only do it or I, I've only been able to do it because of, I've been building on the backs of the generations before me. You know, my grandmother had to work in a factory sewing like a machine and getting paid nothing so that my mom could live a slightly better life than her, you know? And then my mom had to work in a world where she wasn't allowed certain types of education because of the color of her skin. And, and she worked really hard to overcome those obstacles to the best of her ability. And then she created a better life for me. And so my mom always said to me, each generation needs to be better than the next. That is, that is the purpose of what we're trying to do. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't take that for granted. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is a jump and a step because, you know, America is a country that's defined so many things that happened around the world. So when you come from a developing nation or a, or a smaller country, it is a big jump. It is a big jump to go and make your name um, in any country, more especially America. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Again, and you know, I think I want to go back and just say, you know, even when we talk about like developing nations, um, you know, there's a hubris that happens to be here in our land where we look at it like, oh, well, you guys are a developing nation and we're this and we're that. And they forget that we are all on this like same planet together. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, we're all bound by gravity so that no one's better than anyone else. And I, you know, I would argue that your experience, the way you were raised and your culture and your family and, and their outlook on life um, has made you what it is that you've become. And um, 
people people have no idea um, that they should be wishing to have your sense of understanding because <laughs> of and 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 they, if they were to just take a look at your balance as a human being, um, they would envy that. I appreciate. They would that envy for that. Real. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I don't. I'm, I'm telling you, I don't take it lightly what you do, bro. No, not at all. You know, you make a lot of you make a lot of sense, and you know, it's ingenious to always inject you know humor in those moments because it's sometimes it's a very heavy pill to swallow. You gotta have mm -hmm. some sugar somewhere, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's a, that's that's an art form in itself. I, I I think I adopted a lot of that from from my mom. Funny enough. Um, any semblance of of good you will see in me is only a fraction of of what my mother possesses as a human being um, because she has developed an innate understanding of the we you know the collective we you know as we say ubuntu you know you know that from south africa and and it's and it's the idea that i am because of you we're all connected as human beings. Very difficult to actually to, to apply because we can think it theoretically. We all love to think it theoretically. Oh, we're all in this together. We're all, you know, we're all doing this thing together. But but there is a when you truly understand it. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was really young, I used to do the garden with my mom, and um, and one day we were cutting the grass, and my mom says to me. Look at our neighbor's lawn. He never cut his grass. He had, you know, the, the grass had grown, I think it was like five feet high at this point. It looked like a jungle next door to us. And my mom said to me, man, this, this guy's yard is, is so messy and it's so crazy. And she says, you know what? I'm gonna go and talk to him. And she goes and she rings the doorbell next door and she says, there's this old white man. And she says to him, uh, hi, excuse me, um, your grass is really tall. And he says, yeah, I don't, I don't care, I don't care. And my mom says, okay, um, can we cut your grass for you? And so I'm standing on the side, I'm like, we, who's we? Because I wasn't involved in this negotiation. Nobody asked me about cutting my neighbor's grass. I just cut our grass, which I already hated doing. And so my mom said, no, we would like to cut your grass. And the guy was like, I don't, I'm not gonna pay. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested, I'm not gonna pay. I don't wanna pay anything, go away. And mom said, no, I'm not coming here for a job, sir. I'm your neighbor, I would like to cut your grass for free. And he said, why? And you could see that, I mean, the guy was, he was <laughs> extremely confused. And my mom said, because your grass needs to be cut. And the guy said, okay, but I'm not, you can't use my electricity. I'll never forget that line, it was amazing. He's like, you can't use my electricity. And he like closed his gate and he locked his doors. And then he opened the front gate of the house, you know, so we could like come in to the yard, but we couldn't like get into the house. It was just like this interesting experience. And when he was like, you can't use my electricity. And my mom was like, it's fine. We've got our own electricity. And so she sent me to the house and I had to go and plug in the extension cord. And, um, and we took the extension cord and then, and then I you know, plugged in the lawnmower and then we started cutting this guy's grass. It was terrible. It was one of the worst experiences I've ever had mowing lawns because it wasn't even a lawn, it's a jungle, man. And, and when we were done, because I complained and my mom was like, stop complaining, just cut the grass. And when we were finally done, I said to my mom, why? Why did we do that? This guy's an asshole. He wouldn't let us use his electricity, which we didn't need, but I mean, just the idea of it was such a weird thing. He, he, he wasn't nice to us. Why would we do this? And my mom said, because his grass affects our house. If his lawn is not cut, if his backyard is a jungle, the rats are gonna, the, the rats are gonna grow. There's gonna be more rats, there's gonna be more vermin, they're gonna fest up. And she said, but you know what the problem is? those rodents aren't gonna stay on his side of the, of the wall. They're gonna come to our yard. And so now we're gonna have a rat problem. And so she said, if I want to fix our rat problem, we need to go into his house and fix his rat problem. And, and, and I was like, yeah, but that's not our problem. And she said to me, yes. She said, but that's the problem with the world is we always think it's not our problem, but it will become our problem. And, and so that, that, that's a lesson that always stuck with me. And I think it's an idea 
that is really difficult for us to understand in this world, especially when, when you, you know, when you think of like capitalism and money and how we've all been ingrained into this like rat race of owning it all because we're all desperate to survive and we don't even know how much we need to survive if we're honest about it. We don't know how much is enough. You know, everyone tells you that this is enough to retire, then it's not. And then this is enough to buy a house and then it's not. And so I think we're all in this, in this thing where we're spinning. And, and I think a lot of that contributes to a world where we have lost our ability to realize that somebody else's problem is your problem. When somebody loses their house and they become homeless, you have a homeless person in your neighborhood now. That has become your problem. You know, when somebody doesn't have a job or doesn't go to school or whatever, and then they resort to crime, that crime is now your problem. But there was a point when their problem was your problem and you didn't think it was your problem. And if we found a way to step in then, we may find that there would be fewer problems. And so, I don't know, I, I, please don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect at it by any means, but I, I've grown up and I've been taught to live in a world where I have a lot more empathy and, and shared understanding of the fact that I am sharing the planet with other people, whether I like it or not. I rest my case. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, that anecdote just now that about like what your mom yeah. told you and, and your own experiences and, you know, the way you humanize it saying, man, I didn't want to cut the grass and that would have been me as a child, except I wouldn't yeah. have walked away with understanding the greater purpose. I would still be complaining about it today because I was lazy. <laughs> I'm still lazy. That's why I'm efficient. Wow, that was great. Mm -hmm. Hot. How is that even possible that you're lazy? I mean, you do, you have to stay up on so many different current events. Like, I don't even understand how you can have a job. And I know your job is to stay up on it, but like, w what does a day look like for you? Are you like reading e in the morning e like every newspaper, uh, watching every news program? Like, how does that even work? I, I just imagine you like a sports gambler with 18 TVs in front of you, <laughs> getting ready, <laughs> um, <laughs> watching well, every he, game. Well, the, I used to do that, funny enough. I used to, I literally in my office used to have four TVs running with all the news happening all the time. Then I came to realize, and this was, this was a strange realization for me, I came to realize that a lot of cable news in America is not about informing people. It, it, it's about creating content. You know, it, it, it builds animosity. It keeps you glued. There's always something breaking. You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. It's always breaking now. Yeah. I remember yeah, the, oh, that yeah. the days when breaking news meant a thing was actually happening. It actually happened. But now everything yeah, is breaking, yeah. breaking, 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 breaking. The whole day can't be breaking. Then, then the world <laughs> is broken. And, and I think inevitably that's, that's what it's created in America is this, is this weird, I, like they, they've almost tapped people out in terms of caring because the news has made it seem like things are always happening. And if things are always happening, because I guess of hedonistic adaptation as humans, we, we have to get used to it. At some point as humans, we go, you know what, there's too much to care about. There's always something happening, I'm done. And, and I, 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 I don't think, you know, I, I blame just people for that. But, but I think cable news has, has, has done a really good job of, of creating that environment in America. And so what I stopped doing was I stopped watching cable news as a, as a whole. I started reading more. You know, I found I could read at my own pace. I found that reading presented a lot more nuance and what it removed was, was a level of disinformation that was created either through an agenda or just through the person's filter. You know, because like what I do is I, I, I tell you up front, this is my opinion. I'm making the show as Trevor, these are my opinions. What the news does in America is it doesn't tell you that it's people's opinions. You know, it makes it seem like this is news, but it's not actually news. These are the opinions of people on a channel that calls itself news. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, stopped, I stopped watching cable news and I just started reading. And that's what I do every single day is I, I wake up and I read as much as possible. I read everything, everything that I can, everything that interests me. Some things I read just to keep up on. You know, I'll read, you know, about the Democrats and their spending bill. And I, I read about the Republicans' objections. And then, and then I go beyond Democrats and Republicans in politics. I try and read up on issues that are taking pr place around the U.S. And then I'll read up on things happening in South Africa, you know, whether it's our local elections and what people are going through and why they're not turning out to vote or 
or I'll read up on on what's happening in you know the COP26 or climate change and how you know many island nations are saying, hey guys, we're gonna die in the next two decades if you don't do something about the climate. And I, I just try and read as much as possible. Um, and and I mean, part of it might be my ADHD. Part of it might be the fact that I've always loved consuming information. And and that's all I try and do: consume as much as possible um, for myself as a human being. And then now I have a job that also benefits from it. So so I've 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 always enjoyed keeping abreast in that. And then I and then I read 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 read. And then at some points I'm like, okay, I'm going to present a show on this thing. Let's uh, let's 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 do it. Um, but I but I'm extremely lazy as a person. And what I mean by that is, I um, I don't I don't like to work just for the sake of working. I don't, you know. I was talking to Kevin Hart about this the other day. He loves working. I don't like just working for the sake of working. I, I, I <laughs> and I think a lot of people have forgotten that, you know, leisure is the purpose of work. You know, like I think people people have forgotten that. We used to live in a time when we would work, in order to live. But now we live in order to work, and 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 America is really good at tricking you into that. I was getting swept up in it until the pandemic, but now I'm comfortable in saying like, no, man, I'm here to do as much as I can and as much as I would like to do. But then, for the most part, I'm looking to enjoy living as a sentient being and enjoying my existence with other people around me. Sentient is very important. Um, there's a lot of people who uh, they're sentient sense has been hijacked. They oh, yeah. don't realize that they don't feel. You, you talked about that very early in the conversation, empathy, the importance of empathy. Without empathy, there is no, there's no chance of a connection between people. You can't um, see or feel or hear or sense where someone else is coming from, mm -hmm. you know, you're nine times out of 10 not gonna care because right. your phone is telling you everything mm -hmm. that you wanna hear, making you feel the way you wanna feel, showing you mm -hmm. what it is that you wanna see. And, um, and along comes a complete stranger who needs that, connect, that sense of connection with you um, and that sense of community with you, but they can't get it because you've deemed them your enemy or your phone has painted them to be your enemy before they even right. said hello to you. And, and right. you might have been, you might have been what could have changed their lives or saved their lives at that moment. And um, you talk about being a sentient being. It's like it's, it's very important. Like we need more people to be sentient, you know, and forgiving because there's not a lot of that either. Yeah. So I had a question. Um, you said you unplugged from the the, the, the cable news. And you started reading. Do you have a one? Do you have a main source that you rely on, rely um, on or believe? I mix in? everything, because I've I've come to realize there's a difference between truth and facts. Uh huh. So, okay. in my opinion, truth is oftentimes a shared reality that we agree upon as people. Um, mm. Facts are things that nobody can dispute. I mean, people can dispute them, but I mean, they they exist with or without your approval. You know, gotcha. gravity is a fact. That is a fact. There are certain things that yeah. are facts, whether you like it or not. Truth is something that people can agree or disagree upon. You know, um, so so what I try and do is I, I read as much as possible, and I, I read from as many different sources as possible because I I, I like to understand where people's truths overlap. So mm. I want to read Al Jazeera and the New York Times and I want to read the Hong Kong Times, and then I want to read what's happening on Reddit sometimes, and then I want to read what's happening on Twitter from a thread. Uh, you know, I'll follow a few professors at, who, who specialize in certain topics. I, I'll follow people in finance and economics. I, uh, I'll, I'll follow people from, from Africa, from Europe. From, and, and what I do is I try and get a sense of what's happening all over the world from mm -hmm. different people's perspectives because there is no one truth. That's one of the hardest things to accept in society. There is no one truth. And so whenever something is happening, everyone is experiencing it, but from the perspective of themselves. And so, um, you know, one of, one of, the, one of my, the best things I ever did was, was go on a, on a tour um, of, of the, the mu Museum of Rodin in, in Paris. 
And and Rodin is an amazing sculptor who who he just like worked on creating, you know, humans in in all just in all different states of being. And he told stories with things that do not move. And 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 I had this amazing tour guide, uh, Jean Manuel. And I remember he told me. He said to me, um, he said, what, is, what do you see in, in the statue? And we stood and I described what I saw. And he said, no, that's, that's not what it is. He, and he said something else. And I said, no, that's not what it is. And I said this. And, I, and we went back and forth. And then he said, now, my friend, I want you to come and stand on this side of the statue where I was standing, and I would like you to see what I was seeing. And I saw, and I was like, oh, that's exactly, yes, now I see what you were seeing. And he, yeah. said, and he said, this, just like life, this is what sculptures essentially show you about life is that we can be both looking at the same thing and disagreeing on what it is because we are looking at it from different perspectives mm -hmm. you know you are looking at the same thing as me and you're like trevor you're crazy this statue has no face and i'm like are you crazy this statue has i'm looking at the face it has a face but you're standing behind it i'm standing in front of it we're both telling the truth yeah. The fact yeah. is that the statue has both a face and no face because it has the back of a head. The truth is that we're both not seeing the thing. So what I try and do is, is, is really just jump into as much as possible because I've come to understand that everybody can have a different truth. Everybody can be correct at the same time, which is a paradox, but it, but it, but it is in fact life. And so, so what I'm trying to do when I have either a discussion, an argument, a show, whatever it is, is I, I'm trying more and more to apply my mind to the idea that I understand your truth as a person. I can disagree with you still. I can still disagree with you, but I, but I need to at least understand your truth before I can truly disagree with you. Otherwise, what I'm, what I'm denying is your reality. And so, and so that's what I try and do. Um, and sometimes I feel like it's a losing battle because I, you know, to, to, to what Pharrell was just saying, like, I think in America especially, and it's going to start spreading around the world, social media has just turned us into these creatures who only yeah. communicate through little bites where we don't talk, we don't have a conversation, and now we're being pushed more and more into these silos where we only are going to be with people who agree with us on everything. But that's not how you create, that's not how you move forward, that's not how you exist as people. In my opinion, that's how you get to places of genocide is because at some point you go like, all right, there's enough of us. These people shouldn't exist. They're not even human. We've got to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I don't mm -hmm. know about you, when I was growing up, I didn't agree with half of the things my friends said, you know? Yeah. Half of exactly. my friends yeah. would say bad, crazy things about women. Half of my friends would say bad, crazy things about gay people. And then I would say ignorant things about life. And, but, but what we would do is we would grow with each other and we would shape each other. Mm -hmm. And so when I look sure. back now and I go like, man, I'm so glad that I have the friends I had because they helped me mature my views. I don't think the way I did when I was 15. I don't think the way I did when I was 25. And I hope to continue that journey as a human. But I would not have continued that journey if I was living in a world of social media because then the journey would have been curated for me by the algorithm and I would have only been with people who agree with the way I see the world. They only would have agreed with my truth. So, so that's why I try and absorb for, from as many different places as possible um, because I, I don't want to lose that as a person. And I think, I think we are in mm -hmm. danger of losing that every single day. I'm probably like one of the, especially out of these two, I only wanted to be on like Facebook <laughs> still. So, <laughs> and, and listen, Let's look at him. Like he 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 been telling me to get off Facebook. But I told him years ago <laughs> before. Years ago. Yo, listen, tell him how long ago it was. Listen, way before that. they started talking about like yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. dangers of it and what it does and how it works and yeah, yeah, yeah. He, how he it early. colors. Listen, he was a long early. time ago. Yeah. I'm listen, I'm still, I, I would notice the difference in people's behavior from Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. From people who were on there and other people who weren't. I was like, yo. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, it, it's a it's a little, co listen, how long ago was it, guys? It was at least, it was a while ago. It was a long time ago. It was before any, it, it was like this. I, I, at that time, I won't even really own it like that. But No, I, he was like, no, nah, man, I think I it's just. I was fighting for it, though. He was like, no, nah, man, I think it's just you, man. I just yeah, think yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just don't <laughs> like the platform. I'm like, bro, I'm telling you, man. You because in the beginning, I, I thought it was, this was a big difference from Instagram. 15, maybe. 2015? Yeah. Easily. Easily. It was early when it first started. And I didn't even really rock with Facebook like that at the time. But then I started getting on it and, 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 and 
trying to convince him, like, yo, it ain't what you think. I'm telling you, you it's all about the people you follow. You got to per... But nah, it's, it's the devil. So... Yeah, man. The devil. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, listen, it's, it's, my I've point... Always, I've my, actually always my, been my, fascinated, Pharrell, from, like... Like, I would, I've always wondered where you get your... I, I don't know what it is. It's like a... You know, I remember from the first time you came to South Africa, you know, someone was talking about, like, your, your, your backstage setup. I remember this. Because I was doing a show in, in a venue that you had played. One of the very early times you came to South Africa. And they were like, yo, man, this guy, in his backstage area, they were like, all he has is... And you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it was it was some form of spiritual books, and there was like a candle Paul or something. Sagan. It was just like a. They were like, <laughs> "This is the, the the least rock and roll setup we've ever seen, of somebody backstage." Oh, but, like this was it was the most peaceful setup that I'd ever heard. And I, I've always wondered like where you developed that from and how you've maintained that peace because you've always struck me as somebody who's constantly trying to resonate at the same frequency as the universe, if that makes sense. Um, it's me, man. It's me, it's me it's Get it from me, man. I, uh, well, first of all, there was only really a photo of, uh, a photo or a painting of Carl Sagan, and that's because my tour manager at the time, like maybe 20-something years ago, just thought it was funny to continue to put on my writer, there must be some sort of image of Carl Sagan, because I was such a... I'm, I am, still am, such a Carl Sagan fan. He did a, a series called Cosmos. And um, it's really fascinating, even if you watch the old one. Like, the new one is Neil deGrasse Tyson, but the, the old one is just as fascinating. It's amazing. Um, and But I never requested that. <laughs> you know, if anything, my, my um, dressing room was always like, you know, peanut M&Ms, you know, back in those days, I was eating like Doritos and shit like that. I don't eat that stuff now, but um, I do like a more healthier version. But um, it was just mainly just like a lot of junk food. Um, <laughs> but that that uh, that which I still love. But what you're talking about, um, the energy that I feel like I vibrate naturally. Um, is exactly what you said. It's like trying to stay, you know, trying to trying to stay in tune with the universe because I realize that like we're spirits encased in our bodies, and God is watching, and um, I just know I'm blessed. Not perfect, but I'm definitely blessed. Mm -hmm. And and um, the older I get, the more that just the more that that just like, it's just at the forefront. And I, you know, since I was young, I was always obsessed with like the mysteries, you know, the mysteries that are like associated with like the pyramids and the, the Egyptians and, you know, a lot of esoteric stuff. Um, but I always noticed in like throughout like different religions, there were like a lot of commonalities that would pop up and it right. would just always be about this incredible reverence for God, the mm -hmm. all that is, all that ever was, all that ever will be. And um, and that's just something that just like never left me. And I think I just, again, it just it's just snowballing and just be, becoming like a bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger influence in my life. So that, so I just walk with that energy, you know? Um, I think when I came to South Africa, that time that you were referring to, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or more. Yeah. Um, I think I was still like in an egotistical place, you know, like you couldn't tell me. <laughs> um, and not recognizing like how, I mean, I loved South Africa, but it was more like I was showing up to South Africa right, versus right, right, like, okay. holy, I've been blessed to, sh to be welcomed in South Africa, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, and that is pretty much like every day I wake up like, wow, thank you, God, I've been welcomed to another day. Wow. Versus like, I woke up like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like the complete opposite of that because I just couldn't imagine. I mean, if you, if you think about where you come from or fam, where you come from, or Scott, 
Um, if you think about where we come from, you know, the blessing that has been our lives, that continues to be our lives, could have gone right next door to our neighbors. True. But for mm -hmm. whatever reason, the mm -hmm. universe wrote it, that it would be us. And that notion, that right there is like, man, that's like Christmas every second. Yeah. That's what I walk with. It's deep. It's true though. Yeah. It's crazy. I was actually speaking to Jeff Ross and he told me that you recommended going to Africa for the uh the crowds, that he'd never experienced anything like it. And he and he he wanted me to tell you that he did and it was amazing. What what do you think it is about about that? I think it's the fact that South Africans do operate with a level of gratitude that I think is often lost in places like the United States. The gift and curse of coming from a place where there is everything is the fact that there is everything. And so what happens is you get used to your blessings and you stop counting them. And that's something that I think we are all guilty of as people, you know, is it's very difficult to, to keep counting your blessings. It's, it's very difficult to exist in a state of gratitude. But when you live in South Africa, I remember when they would say, Pharrell Williams is coming. We all knew Pharrell Williams was coming. It wasn't like, ah, I'll catch him in another city. Ah, what? We were like, yo, this person who makes the music that we have been dancing to for this long is coming and we are, this is a thing. You know, when, 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 when someone would have a comedy show and they would be funny, we'd be like, this is a thing. This is amazing. This is, I, and I, 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 I honestly, I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but I, I, I think it has something to do with, with, with being grateful. We didn't always have. We still don't always have. And so what happens is when you don't always have, you come to appreciate. I mean, small things. Right now, South Africa is going through an electricity crisis, you know, uh, the, the previous government didn't do a good job of setting up an infrastructure that would sustain a country that was fully catered to. And then the c government that took over from that government didn't do a great job of, of preparing for, for a future catastrophe. And so now South Africa has rolling blackouts and we've got a lot of issues with electricity. But one of the ironies of that is people are really happy when the electricity's on. You know, and like, these are like friends of mine. I'm, I myself, when I'm home, I'll be like, oh man, there's electricity. It's, and it's such a dumb thing to be happy about. No one should have to be happy about that. But that's where you realize what, what not having can do to you as a person and what too much having can do to you or, or, the, or the lack of awareness that you, that you haven't always had. Um, and, and, and so, yes, it, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, sometimes it can be, you, you can forget to express gratitude. Sometimes you can forget to appreciate because that becomes your new normal. But, um, but, but the same way you appreciate something when you've lost it and you find it again, I think that's something that South African audiences have. I find African audiences in general will have that vibe to them is where they, they just have this, this, this thing. As, as Africans, we, we appreciate it because we didn't always have it, nor do we think we will always have it. And I, I think that creates a different feeling in an audience. I sometimes feel that even in America, to be honest with you, you know, like some of my favorite shows will be in the cities that nobody considers the best cities, you know? Like doing a show in LA, it's great and everything, but sometimes like half of the crowd feels like they're like, yeah, I, I should be on stage. Technically, my agent told me that I should be doing... They've lost their ability <laughs> to appreciate the yeah. thing, I think, a lot of the time, because they feel like the thing should be promised to them. You know, they've lost the ability mm. to be an audience because all they're focusing on is being the creator of what the audience want to see. And, and so when you travel to other places, I've been to cities in America, like people ask me this all the time. They go like, why do you go to these random places? I'm like, yo, because... I'll perform in some of these places. I'm like, this is the best comedy show I've ever had because they're treating it like this is a comedy show that wasn't going to be here. And, and, and then I become grateful to them for reminding me of how much fun we can have and, and how special this thing can be. And so, and so yeah, that's, that's why I told Jeff Ross. I said, hey, man, go to South Africa and you'll, you'll truly experience like what an audience can be. Mm. Let me tell you something I right think, now. I think an easy... South Africa... Oh, yeah. When we went there, I don't know, 15 years ago with Snoop, that we played Drop It Like It's Hot. I lost. I'm <laughs> telling you right now, 
I'm telling you right now, you've never felt anything. Like, I'm agreeing with what he's saying. You've never felt nothing like that ever in your life. And I was blessed enough to go um, another time. I think this is another time I saw you, Trevor, which was, um, what yeah. was this for? This was for, um, Global with Citizens. Hugh, yeah, Global Citizens with Hugh Evans. Yep. Man, listen. Again. Bro, and we went on that stage, and the way that they roar, and the way that they sing your songs, it is, it's an audience you've never felt before, but honestly, I was like a kite, because they, they were singing, and my feet were just leaving the stage. I was just like, it, it was unreal. Uh -huh. Definitely top five show of all time in my life. That's like, yeah. I love going back to South Africa. Every time I've ever done a show there, it's like, it's crazy. How often do you go back? I used to go back frequently, actually. So when I first got to the US, I would go back um, maybe every two months. It's a 16 hour flight, so it's, it's, it's hard, but I, I would do it. Um, then I think my frequency changed because my friends started coming to the US so that I didn't have to always make the trip. And so we'd, we'd split the difference. Um, so then I would do maybe twice a year, three times a year. And then, I mean, since the pandemic, I haven't been back just because the borders have been closed. So I couldn't leave and then I couldn't go because I was doing my UK tour. So then the UK wouldn't have allowed me in if I'd been to South Africa in the preceding 14 days. So yeah, it's now been, it's going to be close to two years very soon. Um, yeah, which is, which has left a hole in my, in my soul, you know, it's left a, uh, it's left a gap where, where, where my people used to be. I was, I was actually chatting to a friend the other day and I was like, man, I take, I've taken for granted how much like the languages I speak with my friends back home are a part of who I am as a human being. You know, these are, these are, I never thought of it like that, but it's a piece of my personality. It's, it's, it's a piece of my storytelling. In fact, every, every word that I've learned, every, every language that I speak is a piece of another human being that exists within me as I live and breathe today. So, so yeah, so I, uh, I'm excited to get back. I'm, I'm making time now that borders are all reopening. I'm, I've, I've already booked off the time to make sure that I get back home and just, um, as we say back home, you know, touch, touch our blood. Yeah, you know, just want to, yeah. just want to touch my people again. Just, you know, amazing. I get it. Do you, do you have, do you have like a close friends that you grew up with still that you still keep in contact with? Yeah. So I've, I have a group of friends that I've been friends with now for, what am I now? 37, I'm 37. I'd say we started together at like 21, 22. So what, 15 years. And, and they're like my, I mean, these, we literally all started our careers and it's all different careers, by the way, together. You know, some people work in advertising, some people work in, in radio, some people work in, in like mining, but we all started this journey together and we're still friends today. I still lean on them for advice. We still talk about everything. We still argue about everything. That's still, that's one of my favorite things. I always say to them, I go like, guys, I love you guys. I really have fun with you, but man, I love how much we argue. I love how much we fight about ideas. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't let each other get lazy when it comes to thinking. We fight each other. And, and that's something I really, really enjoy. Um, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still, I mean, every single day we're, we're in our little chat group on WhatsApp and we, we just, you know, no one, no, one, no one lets a day go by. Everyone's talking about something and it goes from everything. We can talk about art, we can talk about life, we can talk about politics, we can just share a funny meme. It doesn't matter what it is. We're always communicating, we're always sharing and we're always growing together. And so they come to the US, they'll come and visit me. We do um, a lot of our vacations together as a group, try and see new countries together, you know? Um, and yeah, we're always pushing each other to grow. They're, they're, they're one of the biggest reasons for me existing the way I exist today. That's amazing. I, I, my, my next question to you is, you know, the phones control everything now. Mm -hmm. and people don't realize it. You know, the phones, you know, pretty much are leading everything. People feel like, you know, they have a democracy. But I always say, um, even when it comes to a multiple choice answer, um, if the answers are given to you, that's not really a democracy. And so, um, because of that, like a lot of people really don't, they're just being led. 
They mm-hmm. don't have any idea which way they're going. And because they pay their phone bills, they live and die by what they what they have determined to be the truth. Um, so now that we're living in an age where like people don't value offline as much as they do online, um, and online is where the currency in every way, shape, and form is. Um, and last but not least, you know, you see Facebook has mm-hmm. just changed their name, right? If mm-hmm. they're heading in that direction, um, what do you think life looks like five years from now? I mean, I have my own opinion, but I would love for people to hear like such a bright mind like yours talk about like the idea that there's no turning back now. Like we're here, we're, we're, we're living, this is it. What's, what do you think life looks like in five years? I don't know what life would look like in five years because I think time is an interesting thing in that it often moves faster or slower than we ever predict. You know, it depends on the the event that takes place. What is the inciting incident that, you know, the catalyst that sets things into into effect? Um, You know, the pandemic is a great example. If you had asked me three years ago what I think the world would be like in five years, I wouldn't have accounted for the pandemic. And so that would have shifted everything. I think the pandemic has dramatically changed how we're going to live going forward. I think the reason a lot of people are quitting their jobs is, you know, for very good reason, I think that a lot of people have just taken a moment to pause and go like, wait, 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 what was I doing? What am I doing? Who am I doing this for? And yeah, that's scary for people who talk about the economy and businesses and companies. And, but a lot of these articles are not being written about people. That's what I find interesting. They always say like, companies are struggling to find employees. You know, corporations are really struggling to keep people. It's, it's always framed from that direction. What they're not saying enough is human beings are getting in touch with being human again. Humans have realized that there's more to living than just creating for a corporation. And that's a scary thing to realize when your whole identity has been built around it, not just as people, but also as a nation. You know, there's no denying that America has for a long time considered its purpose the creation of the corporation. This is what this country is. I mean, from the very beginning, you know, from the first ships that came in here, it was about how do we make this business. the business continent? You know, that's fundamentally that's right. what a lot of being American is about. And so that's why they called them founders. When, 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 when I look at that and you look at the pandemic, I think the pandemic has shifted that. I think it's shifted how we're going to communicate virtually or not going forward. I think a lot more remote work is going to happen, you know, in a way that it never did. And so in five years, the, the gift and the curse of what has happened to us is we have found more ways to connect with people in a non-physical way that has maybe helped us to some degree, but I hope that it doesn't hinder us because it may further entrench, you know, us in a space of not connecting physically with people. It, 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 yep. it may, like part of my brain goes, there could be the possibility that this new way of working could be the thing that saves us as humanity. And what I mean by that is this, for a long time, societies were defined by the people who lived in them. And, and so what happened is the societies existed with the young, the, 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 you know, the middle-aged and the old. And that's, that's what you had. And it was, a, it was a fantastic cycle. Then what happened was, you, you, you know, we, we, the Industrial Revolution kicks, kicks in and now you've got factories and you've got places of work. And so everyone goes to those places now. But what happens is, Not everyone, the able-bodied go to those places. If you're too young, if you're too old, you stay where you are. And so there's this migration of work that happens. And what unfortunately I think happened there was we then started existing in a world where all, you know, all, all certain thinkers ended up in the same place, which is good because then you end up with things like, I guess, Silicon Valley and you, you, you have these giant leaps and advances where people go like, we're here to create, we're here to create. That's great. But it also creates a brain drain somewhere else. And so now you have the disconnect between the rural areas and the cities. You know, rural folks think like this, city folk think like that. And it's like, no, I think there's a good balance that could be maintained. You know, I, I think it's good that you have people who are still attached to the earth. I think it's good that you have people who think of the old ways and they, and they tell you the stories. I mean, in South Africa, that's what it's all about. You, you, you're taught to respect your elders and the journey and the story that they, that they, that they possess for you. You know, you're not supposed to discard that thing. And so, I, I hope, if I think of the positive future, 
I hope that in the, in the next five years to 10 years, we live in a world where the next Pharrell doesn't have to leave Ohio or Detroit or, or wherever they're from to go and make it. They don't have to go, I'm going to LA to do this because that's where you have to go. They're like, no, I can make it here. And then what'll that, what that'll do is it'll create a nuclear explosion of success that hopefully affects the community that they live in because that's what success does. Success begets success. I hope that happens because of this new remote world of work. The, 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 the pessimistic side of me goes, ah, oh, man, we've just become more connected to the digital world. And so to your point mm -hmm. of Facebook changing its name, I am afraid that we are going to exist more in the metaverse. You know, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. I was one of those people where most of my connections came from sitting, playing video games for hours on end because that's where my friends were. I couldn't go outside and see them. They couldn't come to me. We were in different cities and different countries on different continents. And so now we spent our days running around a wasteland called Vedance, shooting random people. But really what we wanted was to connect with each other. <laughs> and so if you look at how video games are shaping the way people connect, if you're looking at, at, at how digital media's, you know, clubhouse, all these things, people are connecting, yes, but they, 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 they're losing the human moment. You know, we, we're mm -hmm. losing the ability to sit in a room and just feel each other, you know, that and that's sentient. a special feeling. You're losing that sentience. Yeah, that's, it's a special, it's a really special feeling to just be in a room with somebody and feel them vibrate. That's why I reacted the way that I did when you said, you know, being a sentient being and you use that word, I was like, oh, he really, really, really gets it. And people should understand what he's saying because this is where we're going. Uh, we already did. Yeah, is, we're, we're, is, we're already there, but, well, it's good, but we're not done going. It's gonna get deeper and deeper and deeper. That's what I'm saying. Like you're gonna, in the same way that we've seen our parents, you know, on Facebook and you're like, man, what do you know about Facebook? Listen, metaverse. they gonna be on the metaverse, bro. Mm -hmm. What you know about the metaverse? It's, I mean, it's think real. about it. Now, now kids are going to a Travis Scott concert inside a video game called Fortnite. Think, just think of that level. Yeah, now, that's crazy. I mean, in Fortnite, the game has created a space where people can hang out, and it's not even about the game anymore. They don't even shoot each other anymore. So now the purpose, because video games used to be like a, a puzzle-based purpose. That's what a video game was. You play Mario Brothers. The point is to get from one point to the next point and save the princess. Mm -hmm. Now, the point of the game is to exist within it. That, yep. That's a scary yeah. future when you think about it. What's yeah. that movie? Ready, Ready Player One? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Ready Player One. Do you think your job has become... Har Do you think your job has become harder now that Trump's out of office? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, you know? Um, it's funny because when I, when I first took over the daily show a lot of people were, were angry at me for not being angry you know because john stewart had just left and i i, I was taking over and a lot of people were angry they're like this guy's not angry enough and i was like what is there to be angry about <laughs> you know I, was, I i don't believe in i don't believe in peddling outrage i don't believe in just being you know angsty for the sake of being angsty as a human um i th i think I think oftentimes that also maybe comes from the life that I've lived, you know? As black people, when we grew up, if you were to be angry about every level of injustice you were experiencing, then you would live in a perpetual state of rage, you know? Yeah. And, and I think Baldwin himself had an amazing quote about that. So I, I you know, I, I guess I, I've always been in a place where I go like, there's a time and a place and a space for everything that you're trying to do. And so, you know, when Trump came into office, what was ironic about him was he reminded me of a lot of the leaders that we have in Africa. You know, he reminded me of a lot of the leaders that, that people have in the Middle East. He reminded me of, of a leader who knows how to harness the, the, the frustrations of people who don't see their lives moving forward and then promises them a fix, a cure-all you know, because, because he, he knows how to capitalize on the fact that people feel stuck with a system that, that, is, that is, you know, not moving. And, and that is oftentimes the byproduct of a, of a, of a system where, where a group of people, you know, like when Congress or whatever it is anywhere in the world, Parliament, Congress, whatever it is, when those people get so caught up in themselves that they forget what they're actually trying to do, 
it's an amazingly fertile ground for people like Trump to grow from because then they come and say to everyone, look how this thing is not working. I can fix all of it. But what they often do is they peddle blame, they peddle shame, they, you know, they, 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 they create more of the othering and you, 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 you develop like, you know, the highest sense of, um, of fear and hatred that, that you can as human beings. And so maybe because I understood a lot of this, 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 um, you know, the Daily Show was, was a vehicle where I could exist in continuously and go like, hey guys, this is happening. I can provide context. You know, it's strange to say, but I was like, I was familiar with it. A lot of Americans were like, we've never seen anything like this before. I was like, well, I have, I have. So maybe, maybe that's why I'm here right now. Um, yeah, you, you know, I used to share yeah, a lot I, of your, I think, um, uh, your, your, your daily shows. Like you was like one of my main bullets in the, on Facebook. Your clips from the daily, the daily show. <laughs> that was like my. I appreciate like that. When you put one of those out, it was like you know, like a two minute joint. I'm like, oh yeah, I got him. Put it on my page because, like, like P said, man, you know how to you know, give us the information, a little bit of humor in it, but it was so much information and and just so on the nose, man. Like, you helped me a lot I appreciate in the metaverse. That. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> He's converted already. I'm in the metaverse. I'm there. I think you are part of one of um, the most successful transfer uh, transitions of power in entertainment that's like forward facing because you were, in my opinion, I, I follow comedy and, and uh, I feel like you were set up to fail. <laughs> like coming in and Jon Stewart, behind Jon Stewart, uh, what he had done and then trying to take over his show. I was just like, how are they gonna pull this off? You know. And I, I remember actually emailing Kent Alterman um, back then saying, wow, you guys really did it. Um, but it just seems to me like uh, you had other things going on and you were a stand up where you were from. Like what, what made you want to like step into th these particular shoes when like one of the first rules of comedy is knowing who to follow and who not to follow? Well, one of the main reasons I wanted to step into those shoes is because of what John actually said to me about his shoes. I'll never forget this. He invited me to join the show before he announced he was leaving. So in many ways, I always say our relationship is, is akin to that of Willy Wonka and Charlie. You know, he invited me in. I had no clue of his world. And once I had just become... I mean, not even accustomed to it, but once I had a familiarity with it, he then announced he was leaving. And and John and I really had a lot of fun together. You know, in the short time that we worked together in the building, we had a lot of fun. And so he made me enjoy the process of what the show was. He made me enjoy what it was about for himself. And we came to see that we shared a lot of ideas about the world. And I always used to say, John and I, we would both come to the same conclusion, but our, our formula, our mathematical equation would be different in how we get there. We would use a different technique because we grew up in different worlds. We think differently. Um, but, but when I, when I got to the show, it was really cool. You know, they, they announced who's taking over, who's not. It was, it was this whole, it was chaos, you know, and, and there were a few things that, that, that I think, you know, happened during that time. Number one, it was assumed that I just got it. When, when the truth is, there were some people who turned it down in order for me to get it. And I always say to people, I mean, that's, that's what life is about. You know, Will Smith had to turn down the Matrix so that Keanu Reeves could get it. Uh, I, 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 I've always enjoyed how life will present to you the thing that is meant for you to have. And then that can often happen because somebody else has turned it down. I mean, you might be in love as a human being because somebody else has turned down somebody else's love. That's, that's life. So, um, so all of this was happening and John, I'll never forget, he called me into his office and the announcement had just been made, you know, I was taking over the show. And John was standing in, in, in the office and he was in his socks and his shoes were on the floor. And he was like, hey buddy, um, he says, uh, what, what, what size are you? Do you want to try these on? What size are you? And I was like, I, I'm a size 11. And he's like, oh, I, I don't know if these will fit. Try, try them on. And I put my foot, and it was, his shoe was much smaller than mine. 
And I was like, no, sorry, man, these are not gonna fit. And I was like, is this like a fitting thing? Is this like a clothes thing? Is this? And then he said, I just want you to remember this moment when anyone tells you, you can't fit my shoes. He says, whenever someone says to you, you'll never fill my shoes, you remember that my shoes were never meant for you to fill because you're gonna be wearing your own. And mm. that was it for me. Wow. I was so... just like, yeah, okay. I'm just here to do my own thing. And it is an impossible thing. Everyone's like, it's impossible to follow John Stewart. Yeah, but why do things if they're possible? That's the whole point of life, isn't it? To do the impossible things, you know? So, so I was like, if it's impossible, then I'm meant to fail at it, which means there's no reason to be afraid of failing at it. And if it's, if it's impossible and I succeed, well, then I've achieved the impossible. And that for me is, is one of the greatest joys in life, going after the thing you're afraid of and achieving it despite everything that you thought wasn't possible. Do you, do you think um, in the beginning when you were doing the show, there was a part of you that was trying to keep his audience and your new audience together? And then it felt like as a viewer that may, I, I, I could be wrong on how long, uh, but let's just say like the first couple of months, you got, it felt like you guys were trying to do that. And then afterwards it felt like, I'm just going to do me. <laughs> and if they don't like it, then they don't like it, but I need to be myself. And I felt like you like broke out of this um, sort of like uh, trying to please everyone and just said, I'm just going to do myself right now. Yeah, you know what? It wasn't, it wasn't a f I've never been a f person. You know, I actually envy people who are, <laughs> you know, I, I've always been somebody who, who reveres audiences. I, I respect people because I go, you're giving me something of yours. You're giving me your time. You come to a stand-up show, you've given me your time and your money to come to a show. I respect you. So it was never, it was never that. It was rather me developing a familiarity with myself, the space, the content, and the audience. And, and like any performer, what you do is you start to develop your thing. You start to realize which parts of the, of the, of the thing are yours and which part of the thing are learned, which parts were, were inherited. You know, and, and I, I'm sure like, you know, with Pharrell, you develop your style, you develop your music, you develop your beats. You go, who is Pharrell? Well, Pharrell is a combination of everything that happened before him. It's a culmination of everything that happened before him. And over time, he develops this unique signature that becomes to be known as his. Um, I think every artist has that journey. You know, every, every, every person who creates something is first creating through the lens of the creators that they saw before them. I mean, hell, we do that as humans, you know? We, we exist the way our parents existed, whether we like it or not. That's our first example of existing, and then we use that as, as the lens through which um, we see the world. And then over, over time, hopefully, we start to realize that we are basically mimicking them, and then we start to shed that and ask ourselves one of the hardest questions to answer, and that is, who am I and who do I wish to be? And, and I'm still on that journey, to be honest with you, you know? Uh, I, I, I ask myself that question every day. When I'm doing the show even, I go like, okay, what am I doing and why am I doing this? What am I trying to achieve? Um, that's, that's basically the space that I exist within. But I, I've never been a f person ever. Um, I care too much. Before we get towards the end, I need to know if this thing I read on the internet is true. Oh boy. Is it true that you were <laughs> illegally selling CDs <laughs> and you were a DJ back in the day? So, yes. Um, <laughs> allegedly, I'll Probably say, because I, I never music. know how these things go. Allegedly, I, uh, <laughs> I, I uh, <laughs> when I was in high school, there was, a, there was a white boy by the name of Andrew Stokes who uh, became one of my closest friends. And he was obsessed with computers. He, uh, he had a CD writer that his dad bought for him. And at the time, I mean, CD writers cost a fortune because you, you, you had a computer which was already expensive, but nobody could write CDs. And Andrew um, started like copying music. He would download music from the internet. And I mean, this is back in the day. This is, we're talking- Allegedly. Yeah, we're talking like LimeWire, Napster days. You remember those? Yeah, and, mm -hmm, of um, course. And so this is when Winamp was the best music player around. And so... And what music were you listening to? I wasn't listening to much music because my mom only allowed me to listen to gospel. So I was only listening to like church music most of the time. Um, and this actually became my introduction to music. So Andrew was, had the music and he would sell, you know, pirated CDs at school 
kids would be like, oh, I want the new this album, I want this album, I want this album. And Andrew would sell the people the albums. And then what happened was uh, some of the kids in school realized that Andrew was like this timid white boy, and then some of the black kids were like, yo, I'm not going to pay this kid, but I'm just going to get the CDs, which was really shitty. And Andrew was timid, and like he didn't know what to do about it, and he was really sad, and you know, and, and so I was talking to him about this, and I said, well, Andrew, why don't I do this? I know these people. Let me go get, I'll just go get your money for you, man. I was like, they just, they, you know what I mean? They, they're basically treating you like because they know they can, but I'll go talk to them and I'll get the money. And so Andrew said, okay, I'll make you a deal. Because he was selling the CDs at the time for, I think it was like, like $4, let's say. And he was like, okay, I'll give you $2 if you collect the money for me. $2 of every $4. And I was like, oh, I'm in. And that's what I started doing. And then I just became his salesman. And then he didn't interact with anybody. He just, he just made the music. And then that's all I did. And then at some point, Andrew said, hey, I'm tired of this business. I mean, we were in grade nine. But he's like, I'm tired of this business. I'm moving on. Why don't, would you like to take over the business? I'll give you my CD writer and the computer. And I mean, this was, guys, this was like, you don't understand how expensive a CD writer was in South Africa at this time. And so here I was, I had all the power. And so I took over the business. I had this empire and that's when my journey began. I remember one of my best sellers was, was uh, DMX. It was, uh, it's dark and hell is hot. That was like my first best selling album. <laughs> where everybody bought it. And then what Allegedly. happened was people started asking me to make, um, people started asking me to make compilations because they said, hey, Trev, we really love the, some of the songs on some of these albums, but it would be so great if we could just buy like one song at a time. This was long before iTunes, by the way. This was long before these, you know? And, and so they said, well, it would be great. One song, one song. Could you do this? And I said, I could. I could put different songs onto one CD for you. And I said, okay. And I charged them a little bit more because it took more of my time. And then one day someone said to me, hey, you know what would be really great is if you could make it feel like these songs were all on the same album so they didn't jump hard between each other. I was like, oh man, okay, you guys are so demanding. But uh, I, I downloaded some software. And what I would do is I would, I would edit the music and I would try and fade the tracks into each other and I would try and match the waveforms so that the BPMs didn't, didn't crash and I'd basically start DJing. And so one day one of my friends came over to my house and he was coming to pick up some music and he saw me doing this, like mixing two tracks into the other and he's like, yo, I didn't know you know how to DJ. And I said, I don't, I don't DJ, I'm, I'm just mixing the music so that it goes well on the CD. And he said, yeah, that's DJing. He was like, yo, we should throw parties. And I was like, I, I don't go to parties and I don't DJ. And he said, okay, well, let's do this. I'll organize everything. You just bring your computer and you just do exactly what you're doing now, but I'll tell you where to do it. And so that's what we did. Literally carried the tower. You remember those cases, the giant tower case and the huge monitor? And we would carry that around with us and we would go to places and plug speakers into like an amp and we'd plug the computer in. And then live, I would just stand there and I would do what I used to do in my bedroom at home. And yeah, and that, that began my DJing career. And then I would, that's what I would do. And I would play for like eight hours at a time. I'd play everything from R&B at like 1 p.m. Because people would hire me to, to throw, I started off playing one-year-old birthday parties, as in birthday parties for one-year-olds, which is a big thing in South Africa. But it's just a thing people use to actually throw parties for themselves. And so what happened is, I started playing for the one-year-old. So at that time of the day, 1 p.m., all the parents are there. I play like R&B, keep it chilled, keep it, keep it light. When we'd get to like 7 or 8 p.m., I'd start playing like, you know, Jagged Edge and start getting into like, you know, a little more edgy R&B. And then we'd get late, I'd start playing hip hop. And then midnight, we'd go into like house music. And yeah, and I would just DJ nonstop. And that's, that's something that I did for many, many years. And uh, I still enjoy it, but I, I play music for myself now. I think I, I, got, I got tired of people coming up to me and saying, can you, have you heard this? Can you play this song? Uh, Travel, have you played? Can you download? And I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. So I just play for me now. I think, uh, what, what was the guy's name? The, the kid? Andrew? I think uh, we should get Seth Rogen to write Superbad 2 <laughs> in South Africa. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, feel yeah. like <laughs> that's a McLovin character oh, right there that that's you funny. came in. It's all a legend, though. <laughs> 
No. Yeah, well, it's a, it's almost like the DJ drama story too. Mm. So look, question: If you was listening to all gospel, how did you know what um, what records to put, or they just requested what they wanted? No, they requested. I I actually learned music from people. That was that's what I love about my introduction to music is I learned music from people. I I had no clue who One Twelve was. I I didn't know who Montel Jordan was. I knew no no nobody. But then like I would learn like music that most women were listening to because the women were like oh. Oh, please, can you get me this uh, this Casey and Jojo and then this Monica and then can you... And then there I was sitting, because right, you could only write at one speed at the time. So you only wrote the CD as fast as it played. So I would have to listen to the full album. So I would just be sitting in my room. And then if people want 10 copies of the latest Brandy album, well, then I'm listening to Brandy 10 times over. So then I'm just sitting in my room and I'm singing to myself, the boy is mine. That's me now, just like the whole day. So my music was influenced by the people who were buying from me, which, which was a wonderful introduction to music because I think it made me enjoy more music than I ever would have had I just been choosing for myself. That's dope. It's amazing. Jay-Z was recently uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. You weren't actually at there. You were just part of the video. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't physically there. I was, I was working at The Daily Show, but uh, uh, Quest asked me to do a little thing for the video, which again is like a, I mean... I'm going to be part of Jay-Z's induction into the Hall of Fame. You see, the, these are things in life where you just have to pause for a moment and go like, man, what, what, what a life. Like, what a life I've been given the privilege to live. To Pharrell's point, the universe, it's just luck, it aimed in your direction, and, and all you can do is be grateful for that. 100%. So you got a tour coming up, or a new tour right Yep, now. I'm on the road, man, back on the road. It's been great. It's been really good. Started off in London. That was phenomenal. Did, did two shows at the O2. You know, the UK just opened up. It was such an electric feeling. Um, came down, I just did a show in Hollywood, Florida. It's like 40 minutes from Miami. That was also an amazing show. Just, I mean, just, just to be surrounded by humans again, you know? Just to be in a room of people laughing and 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 feeling each other and, and there's, there's nothing like stand-up comedy, man. It's, 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 a, it's a really unique art form in that it is one of the few art forms that cannot exist without its audience. True. You know, it, it is fundamentally about the audience. It is a relationship between the performer and the audience. Um, and so I, I, I'm so happy to be back out there, you know. Every, every city I go to has a different energy. Every place that, I, that I've been has a has a different vibe and so I'm 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 loving it. That's cool man. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very amazing. much. <laughs> All right man, you have a good one. All right, y'all have a good one. Right. Blessings. Blessings.